Welcome back. Today we continue our lecture series on the doors of perception. Now you may wonder what the next talk has to do with perception, but it will all come together in due time. Now this talk weaves together a number of themes that uh, intercorrelate with each other. Uh, the main overriding theme is a quote from a paper published in Neuropsychopharmacology in 1999, namely, Dopamine is the wind of the psychotic fire. And I hope uh, at the end of the talk you will have a better understanding of what is meant by this. Now, another way to headline this talk is to say that psychiatry is the science of neural circuits. Now, why do I say this? Well, it's not enough just to say you have this particular gene or this particular access of a molecule in your brain. You need to also make sense of how this abnormality or how this change relates to the symptom experienced by the patient in the real world. And for that, you need to tap into the circuitry that contains your putative abnormality driving the disease and how it implements those particular functions of the mind that are relevant for the patient in real life in the real world. So I typed here a number of items that uh, you will encounter during this talk and each of these would warrant a talk by itself to unpack it more completely. But we will not do this today. We will just give you a whirlwind tour of one paper and one particular finding but it involves all these themes that I have outlined here, namely the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. This hypothesis, of course, has been around for decades and it has undergone revisions. Particularly, we are now at version number three and I will get into some more detail as to what is meant by that. Now, in terms of circuitry, this paper deals with a circuit going from the hippocampus to the ventral tegmental area or striatum involved in a number of functions, namely novelty, reward, salience, and aversion. Let's look at this for a moment. When you get up in the morning, what gets you going? Well, it is the expectation of reward that gets you out of bed, and it is the experience of salience that lets you determine what is important for you in your life in this particular situation. And if you are like many of us, you are novelty seeking. You need something new every day, some new excitement. You want to go down to LA and meet some new people. That's novelty seeking. And of course, there is aversion, the experience of not liking something and wanting to stay away from something. All these items, novelty seeking, reward, salience, and aversion, are in somehow in some way implemented by the circuitry involving the ventral tegmental area, striatum, and hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex as well. Now, the next theme is people at high risk for psychosis. Uh, psychosis occurs briefly in many normal populations for a brief period of time. Psychosis is not synonymous with schizophrenia. Psychosis is the experience of distorted reality, either hallucinatory activity or false beliefs. And uh, this occurrence of psychosis uh, predisposes you to problems down the road. So there are people that are at high risk for developing more serious psychiatric disorders and this study that we talk about today is an ultra high risk group of patients that are being studied in terms of the circuitry that we have discussed just a minute ago. Now the next theme involves neuroeconomics. Neuroeconomics deals with how the brain encodes for reward making calculations about what is useful to you. What do you want to buy for what price? And believe it or not, these calculations are implemented in a very precise, almost mathematical way in the brain involving the dopamine system. And the last theme we will touch on is the mathematical or computational modeling of circuitry in the brain. You can develop 
ideas as to how different circuits talk to each other by using differential equations that you can put the parameters in, you make a model postulating what influences which circuitry and how they correlate or antagonize each other and you can then run the model through differential equation and uh, determine which model best fits the data most often obtained by functional MRI. So you can see that these five themes really are a whole hodgepodge of things that deserve much more detailed exploration and we will certainly do this in talks down the road. Now the paper that we, was, that we will discuss today is from Translational Psychiatry, one of the nature family of publications, Altered Activation of Connectivity in Hippocampal Basal Ganglia Midbrain Circuit During Salience Processing in Subjects at Ultra High Risk for Psychosis. And it was done by a group in Great Britain, in London, I think it's King's College, uh, and it's a quite amazing paper that we will discuss today. Now, the uh, introduction of this paper states that animal models of psychosis have proposed that abnormal hippocampal activity drives increased subcortical dopamine function, which is thought to contribute to uh, aberrant or abnormal salience processing and psychiatric symptoms. Now, in functional magnetic uh, imaging, uh, the neural responses in a hippocampus basal ganglia midbrain network during reward were studied here in 29 patients, or subjects I should say, with ultra high risk for psychosis and in 32 control subjects. And this is what the comparison is based upon and the data then was used for so-called dynamic causal modeling, a mathematical tool invented by Carl Friston whom we have encountered previously in our discussions of the Bayesian brain. So um, we will not get into the conclusions of this paper now, we will save that for later. Here is again the uh, description of the ultra-high risk group, namely these subjects were identified in South London uh, in a clinical service to uh, follow and monitor folks at high risk for psychosis. Inclusion criteria required the following. Attenuated psychotic symptoms, meaning intermittent mild hallucinations and perhaps mildly uh, um, delusional thoughts, frank psychotic symptoms that lasted less than one week, so a brief intermittent psychosis, or schizotypal personality disorder which is often thought to be a precursor of a more serious schizophrenic breakdown, um, plus a recent decline in psychosocial functioning indicating a genetic risk factor at work. So this is the kind of population that was identified not yet diagnosable with a psychiatric illness but showing telltale signs of high risk of developing a serious psychotic illness in the near future and in fact of the uh, 29 subjects here, four uh, went on during the uh, analysis of the data to a more serious psychotic illness. So here's some of the circuitry that, we'll be, that we will be addressing and we can't go into all the details but I want to give you a flavor. So we have the dopamine system, of course, which comes in two major forms, namely the substantia nigra, which deals with the uh, um, dopamine system involved in movement and is impaired in Parkinson's disease, and the ventral tegmental area, that system which innervates widespread limbic areas, the putamen, the, the caudate, what's called the ventral um, 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 a caudate area as well as spreading out to frontal cortices as well. Here in the left hand side is a more schematic presentation. You see the hippocampus being connected to the ventral striatum. The prefrontal cortex is thought to have a monitoring and dampening function on this circuit. 
So you have some cognitive or executive control, it is hoped, of your underlying dopamine drives. Here is the ventral tegmental area, which is connected to the hippocampus. And there is a loop that goes around. And this is the area that is being analyzed in this particular paper. Here's a more elaborate presentation of this, which lists some of the neurotransmitters. And you can see the core microchip at the center of this here is the ventral tegmental area where the dopamine neurons are housed. The firing rate of the neurons here are controlled in a very elaborate fashion. There are two types of firings of dopamine neurons, namely phasic and tonic. Tonic mean a constant low rate firing rate at a certain frequency and phasic in response to things that are either novel or have increased salience or aversion value. And this phasic firing then is thought to encode the uh, meaning and the relevance of the events that are supposed to be encoded. Here's another presentation of this. So here we have the hippocampal area that is involved and the nucleus accumbens, of course, is where reward is primarily encoded. The ventral tegmental area is here, and you can see the two gates that determine the phasic or tonic firing are here. Glutamine is also involved, as well as GABA. So there is a GABAergic input and a glutaminergic excitatory input which somehow constrain and modulate the firing rate, both tonic and phases, and phasic of dopamine neurons. Now, it's thought that in schizophrenia, something goes awry in such a way that there's an increased glutaminergic input from the hippocampus to the nucleus accumbens, which then increases the a firing rate of the ventral tegmental area in a consistent and sustained fashion. So somehow the feedback loops are not in place. And some people believe that there is a deficiency of GABAergic modulation constraining this dopaminergic circuit that might be underlying psychosis. Now how about salience? Um, there is a central role, it is thought, that dopamine has in mediating salience of environmental events or internal representations, thoughts that you might have or ideas that you might have. And it is proposed that a dysregulated, perhaps hyperdopaminergic state, determines uh, abnormal salience. And in this particular context, delusions then are seen as a cognitive effort by the patient to make sense of these aberrant salient experiences, whereas hallucinations reflect a direct experience of the aberrant salience of internal representations. Antipsychotic drugs then are thought to dampen the salience of these abnormal experiences and by doing so, result in the resolution of symptoms, setting the stage for psychological treatment and reconstruction of a more adaptive way of viewing external and internal experiences. So there's a huge literature that has found that salience and reward anticipation is abnormal in psychosis. You can see a huge number of papers which all tend to agree, here on the left-hand side and here on this side, that there is abnormal reward processing or reward anticipation in psychotic patients, indicating that something is awry in the dopamine control of reward and perhaps salience as well. So here then is the introduction of the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia version 3. Now in version 1, we had a very simple statement, namely, too much dopamine means schizophrenia or psychosis. This was supported by the idea that um, if you take a lot of amphetamine or cocaine, you flood your um, limbic areas with dopamine, which results in a psychotic state. 
conversely, by blocking D2 receptors with uh, potent antipsychotic drugs, uh, you can dampen the psychotic state. So this was version number one. It was found out over the decades that version number one did not account for a whole lot of findings. And, in particular, it didn't account for the ideas of uh, salience and reward processing. So the version number three here proposes that dopamine is in excess in presynaptic terminals somehow, and we don't know how, as a final common pathway of perhaps multiple genetic and environmental influences, there's an increased dopamine loading here going on in the presynaptic terminal, which, may, which results in apparent salience processing as well as aberrant um, reward processing. So once these fa uh, facts were established, researchers went ahead and looked at folks with increased risk of developing um, uh, psychotic symptoms or schizophrenia. Here's a study uh, looking at at-risk mental states looking at uh, presynaptic dopamine concentration. And here you can see the normal control average, and those at risk already show increased presynaptic dopamine synthesis capacity, whereas folks with schizophrenia exceeded even that level, all of this being significantly different from control. So this then is the more modern version of the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, locating the lesion in the presynaptic terminal, somehow the synthetic machinery of dopamine is increased in the presynaptic terminal in response to something that we don't yet quite understand. So here is again a plot of the nature of the dopamine dysfunction in schizophrenia. A number of studies now have shown that it's the presynaptic area that shows the increased dopamine concentration. So this is an impressive array of studies that all agree on the same finding. The study, of course, is available to you by clicking on the slide here in the presentation page that goes along with this talk on our website. OK, back to our paper, which is the foundation, really, for this talk. And here is what they did. Uh, they used a salience integration task, which is a modification of a monetary incentive delay task, bringing in the neuroeconomic theme that I announced at the beginning of this talk. So they showed a number of pictures and um, items to folks while they were in the fMRI scanner. Uh, in addition to having them experience reward by being told they just want some money by performing a certain task, they also showed other items such as disturbing visual images that leads to aversion and negative arousal. So in this particular idea, um, three different items, namely novelty, salience and aversion, are all measured in a counterbalanced way while folks are in the MRI scanner and the, the response, the dynamic response of the brain is measured to all three stimuli. Now the neuroeconomic idea was taken from a gentleman, uh, Knudsen, who is at Stanford, one of the uh, neuroeconomics leader using these kinds of probes to study economic decisions in the brain. However, the grandfather of them all is Wolfram Schultz here, who wrote the paper that launched a thousand papers. Uh, the Neural Substrate of Prediction and Reward appeared in Science. And in this paper, uh, they proposed a mathematical model linking dopamine to the processing of reward. So here is the uh, so-called delayed monetary task. Um, it, while participants are in the scanner, they are supposed to press a button uh, in response to certain stimuli, which allow them to either prevent losing money or making money. And you can then uh, titrate 
uh, this uh, in terms of certain delays and counterbalance and measure the response of the brain to anticipated uh, award, lack of reward, or the experience of monetary loss. And here's the paper by Knudsen that shows what happens. Uh, they chose the cardiac nucleus because it's easy to image. And uh, you can see here in a PET scan as to what happens. And there are two kinds of signals, namely, when you lose money, your signal in the cardiac nucleus is increased, and when you make money as well. So whenever there is a deviation from the mean, um, anything that exceeds or betrays your expectations, your um, dopamine reward system will kick into action. So that is the kind of thought, the kind of technology that the paper under discussion is employing for their uh, salience integration model. So this is the result in normal controls. So you can see that a number of brain areas are involved in reward prediction. Bilateral orbital frontal areas in the midbrain, visual areas, of course, and the hippocampus, uh, and adverse stimuli were noted in the amygdala, hippocampus, and the midbrain. So, items that are important, brain areas important in affective control, are very much involved here, and items involved in the um, um, monetary or in the um, reward system as well. So this then is the key finding. In those folks with ultra high risk for psychosis, there is greater activation uh, of uh, the pallidum bilaterally and the left midbrain hippocampus. So there is a signal that is specific to these folks that differentiates them from normal controls, a vulnerability or a miswiring or alternative wiring of those systems that are involved in salience uh, evaluation and are activated by salience experience. Now a word on causal dynamic modeling. So this is uh, invented by Carl Friston. It uses differential equations and what we do is we compute the uh, bilinear differences uh, from um, the different uh, areas involved. We hypothesize certain parameters that might be involved. We can put these parameters into alternative models, then compare the models to the findings obtained from fMRI and select that model that best predicts the findings that have been obtained. So stimuli like reward predicting and non-reward predicting cues are used to drive the input into the model. And the regions, or three regions were selected, namely visual to hippocampal stream, visual cortical striatal pathway, as well as radionotectal and tectal nigral pathway. Now, in order to get more pixels involved, or voxels in this case involved, for the statistical analysis, they lumped together the uh, ventral tegmental area and called it midbrain. So the anatomy is not as precise as you would, as you would wish, wish, but the uh, N, the total number of folks involved in the study was only 29 and 32. Those, the statistical power, therefore, was limited. So here then is the finding. There is an abnormal, abnormal connectivity uh, from the uh, ventral striatal area to the midbrain area in the ultra high risk. And you can see this finding is not subtle. It's a very dramatic difference that sets these folks apart in the ultra high risk from normal controls. So here we have the hippocampus, here we have the um, ventral striatum and the midbrain which stands in for really substantial nigra and ventral tegmental area, but they have lumped together a larger portion of the voxels. That's why they call it midbrain. Now, to put the icing on the cake, uh, they did a correlation. 
looking at the um, um, degree of abnormal beliefs in these pre-psychotic or ultra high risk folks with this abnormal wiring pattern and you can see there's a very strong correlation of the tendency to have abnormal beliefs and the strength of this particular wiring pattern. So this study then combines all the good stuff that you need to have to make sense of a symptom in the real world environment. It involves a putative transmitter system previously implicated in schizophrenia. It details a circuitry that has been invoked in processing of salience and reward, which are things we do all day long. All of us are always chasing reward and we look out for salience that is important to us. So these are real-world experiences that attempt to go awry in the ultra-high risk group for the development of psychosis. So in summary again, connectivity from the ventral striatum pallidum to the midbrain during a reward prediction was significant greater than in controls in these particular subjects. This is consistent with the idea that increased dopamine function in psychosis is driven by descending inputs from the hippocampus to the ventral striatum, which via the ventral pallidum projects to dopaminergic neurons in the midbrain. So the greater the connectivity between ventral striatum pallidum and midbrain during a reward prediction, the greater the severity of abnormal beliefs. So this paper is the first evidence in human studies to support the proposal that functional alteration in the hippocampal pallidum midbrain pathway relates to the generation of psychotic symptoms. So again, let's step back for a moment and see what this mean and means and what it doesn't mean. We don't know what drives the increased dopamine load in presynaptic terminals in these areas. Many genes have been implicated in schizophrenia, and we don't know the final common pathway, the molecular biology, which would allow for increased dopamine synthesis in these presynaptic terminals. Many genes might be involved in the wiring pattern that is identified here as being abnormally strong, connecting areas with a strength that is supranormal compared to controls. So dopamine may only be the final echo or the final manifestation of a number of cellular changes and genetic changes that play out. Nevertheless, dopamine abnormality seems to be strongly involved in the phenomenon of delusions and hallucinations. Why? Because if we decrease dopaminergic tone with antipsychotic drug, we can alleviate the symptoms. So, although we don't know the detailed pathways leading to the pathophysiology, what we do know is that decreasing dopamine can be helpful. However, we are limited because our drugs do not directly address the presynaptic component of the story. Our drugs address the postsynaptic component. We block dopamine receptors postsynaptically, and that's not where the action is. What we should do is find drugs that directly lower the dopamine synthetic activity in the presynaptic terminal or modify the GABAergic constraint that is imposed on the dopamine system at large. And that has not been done and is a, a topic for active investigation at this time. So this is our talk on the implication of the dopamine system in the development of psychosis invoking a number of different themes from neuroeconomics to genetics to molecular biology as well as circuitry and you can tell that without understanding circuits you cannot understand symptom formation in psychiatry so psychiatry will be and already is beginning to be the science of neural circuits in the brain Thank you for your attention and we'll see you soon again at Behavioral Health 2000.